Yle Podcast. This week, Finland gathers around televisions and punch bowls to celebrate Independence Day, which falls on Friday this year. You might be listening to the podcast over the weekend, but it's likely that if you are in Finland on Independence Day, you will see the president shaking hands with about 3,000 people at his official reception. It's a joyous celebratory event, but in this pod, we want to take you back towards the most difficult moments of Finnish history. So enjoy your scumper this weekend, celebrate Independence Day, but maybe you'll also find time to listen to us as we take you back to the early years of independent Finland. You're listening to All Points North, where we take a look at the stories behind the headlines. Hello and welcome to All Points North, the podcast where we take a deeper dive into the big topics. I'm Egan Richardson and joining me this week is Chel Vesto, an author, playwright and former journalist whose work reaches the parts of Finnish history other literature doesn't. Welcome Chel. Thank you. Now, thanks for coming in. Um, I have to ask ahead of the ball on Friday, are you going to the palace this year? Uh, no, I'm not invited this year. Uh, I've been there, but uh, but I'm not invited and you can't go there if you're not invited. <laughs> yeah, I, I often stand outside hoping to be let in, but no, it's not happening <laughs> yeah. yet. Um, but I mean, you have been before. Can you yes. give us a little insight for our audience who, who are going to be watching on TV tomorrow? Okay. Um, well, in my opinion, I've been there a few times Uh And uh, in my opinion, it's 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 more loose, it's more relaxed than it looks on TV, because the the official part is the part where everybody queues queues up to to shake hands with the president and and uh, and at the moment his wife uh, and and uh, and it looks to be frank. I've never watched it on TV because I think it's totally boring <laughs> to be honest <laughs> it's like watching paint dry it is very but, dull <laughs> but it's very dull but, but this is official and and that one that moment contains some nervousness because when you line up to to go there there's this this army of of photographers on the other side uh, which the tv viewers can't see but you see them when you and you're of course you're afraid to stumble or something but then after <laughs> that in the small small rooms The, the presidential castle is full of small rooms and it's quite relaxed actually because I think behind the curtains in this instance you kind of see a trait that in my opinion is a really good trait in us Finns. We are not very, we are formal, yes, but this is in my opinion a, a quite democratic society. We, we don't have as uh, steep hierarchies as as there are in many other countries and you can sense that behind the scene <laughs> at this ball because uh, it's quite relaxed and, and people from from different parts of society talk quite in quite a relaxed way with one another so it's informally formal it's informally formal which is in my opinion it's uh, quite a good definition <laughs> of us Finns. <laughs> yeah. yeah so th- this week we want to talk about Finnish independence day um, but we're not focusing on the reception the presidential reception and the glittering parties and all of that. Uh, we want to look at one of the less discussed aspects of the story. So for our listeners who <coughs> might not know so much about it, basically I'm going to give a little bit of an insight, a recap of where it all started. So Finland became independent in 1918, and there was immediately a bloody civil war, which was part of the general upheaval in Europe around the First World War. But it also left deep scars as more than 30,000 people died in the violence and the camps afterwards. One of the ways Finland has tried to deal with these scars is silence, um, not discussing the painful memories until they've faded enough to to actually face up to them, I think. Um, So if you are watching the Independence Day reception, you'll see a lot of references to the Winter War um, and the Second World War when Finland came together to defend itself when attacked by the Soviet Union. But ever since I moved to Finland, I have wondered why the first two decades of Finnish independence Mm. are almost ignored. Now, Chell, you've been one of the few people in Finland who is willing to deal with this period in public. Um, I've tried to deal with this uh, period of time in in a few of my novels, yes. 
Yeah. I mean, you've published uh, Where We Once Walked about the immediate aftermath of the Civil War in Helsinki and um, Kangastas 38, which I think is Mirage 38. Yes, Mirage 38, translation, yes. Which looks at the interwar period and, and the rise of fascism through the experiences of a survivor from the camps. Of a young girl who, who was in the prison camps during the summer of 1918, yes. Yeah, which I should mention that the, the camps were mainly for red prisoners after the war. Yes, exactly. Um um, so I just wanted to ask, what makes this period so interesting to you as a Finn who was brought up in Finland? First, I must uh, ma- I must make a small correction. Actually, okay. we became independent at the end of 1917 because the Declaration of Independence uh, was the 6th of December 1917. This is true, yes. But uh, Yes, but um, this is such a vast subject I could rant on <laughs> for, <laughs> for ages, but... Um, Starting with the question, how did I become interested? Well, you kind of gave the answer already. I became interested in this period because when I went to school uh, in the 70s, and even when I studied at the university uh, at the beginning of the 80s, I could sense that there was this silence. Uh, We didn't speak openly about it. Even if, I mean, at that point in time, uh, more than 60 years had already passed, but there were still people I mean, when I grew up, um, we had uh, Urho Kekkonen as our longtime president, and he had participated in the civil war on the white side, on the bourgeoisie side, as a 18-year-old, very young man or or even boy. So the silence was everywhere. Uh, I remember in the history books at school when I was 17, 18, uh, preparing for my exam, it was kind of treated very shortly. And then, of course, the, the Winter War and the Continuation War and later periods of our 20th century history were treated more, much, in much more in-depth. So it was the silence that made me curious. But uh, I think I have to stress that it had nothing to do with my own family. I think in, in Ostrobotnia, the, the region on the West Coast where my parents uh, come from, uh, there were a lot of people in that region who couldn't remain unpolitical at that moment in time, but they did their best. And in my family, it hadn't apparently hadn't been a big issue. So it was a more common interest that drove me to read more and more about these years, 1917, 1918. And, and then it slowly started kind of making its way into my novels. It was not in my first novel. Uh, in English, it would be Kites Above Helsinki, it has never been translated into English. I didn't deal with matters so far back in time. In my first novel, I dealt with the memory of our wars during the Second World War and uh, urbanization and modernization after the Second World War. But already in my second novel, uh, these uh, events started seeping into, into the story. Okay, so you, you're using two terms, a civil war and events. Um, there are a lot of names for this 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 well, war or this conflict. This I is guess. one thing that proves how how tense it has been and how how this subject still touches us. Finn still in in the year two thousand nineteen, there are all these names. I mean, I use the term civil war mostly because the historians recommend it. It's a neutral term. This conflict has all the traits of a civil war. But then there's the citizens' war, then there's the liberation war, and the problem is. Actually, very few of these these names are false, depending on your political views, which always kind of mm, affect your views on history. You can you can call you can give this war all these names, but to me, it's a civil war. Yeah, I'm, I've been corrected by elderly Finns when I've said civil war. When I uh, give lectures or, or have meetings with readers uh, about my books, I mean, I'm I'm quite widely read, so I. I do a lot of appearances. It's not uncommon that elderly Finns, both men and women, they, in a very polite and, and civilized way, they might come afterwards and say that we like what you do, but it's, it's, it's the liberation war, not the civil war. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so I, I notice it, that that social situation is familiar to me. <laughs> yeah. um, you said that you didn't learn much about it in school or even in university, um, but when you started to to look for information. How easy was it to find? Re- to, it was to much research? more difficult than it's nowadays. 
in 2019 because we have become, it's, it's also important to stress that we have become more open about this civil war and the year 1918. When I, um, when I started getting interested, this was in the, at the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, there had been one period of opening up earlier, and that was the, the 60s and the radical, the radical era, the leftist era in the 60s and 70s. This era brought with it, uh, of course, first and foremost, Weiner Linna and his uh, novel trilogy of novels, uh, which dealt with this war in a, in a way that probably no Finnish writer or novelist had dealt with it before. And they were at the same, uh, during the same time, there were also writers like Paavo Rintala and Veijo Meri who also wrote historical novels, which were more liberal or leaning to the left than perhaps what had been written in the 30s and, and, and 40s and, and 50s. So the 60s had a big impact in this case, as in so many cases. But um, those were still different times. The country was in one way mentally still divided. So there was the way the left looked at 1918, at the civil war, and there was an immediate, very strong reaction from, from the bourgeoisie or from the right. We, we won't have it this way. So it was more conflicted in the 60s. But we had books and also research that for the first time showed what had really happened. Up until that time, in my opinion, the victors, the ones who won the war, the whites had dictated how history was written. This was only a partial breakthrough. Then again, after the radical uh, leftist era of the 60s and 70s, the 80s were again different. And then came the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the 90s, which in my opinion probably first led in many countries and probably also in Finland to, to a, a kind of, not a na na nationalist uprising, but a nationalist view was was more easier to express. But after that, during the new millennium, I think we gradually became more open to our history. So when I first did research about this in the 90s, it was more difficult. And of course, internet existed, but you didn't use it. I mean, you didn't have this access to information that we have today. You had to go to the archives and dig much deeper to find anything. Today you find superficial knowledge very easily, but it's also, in my opinion, easier to find deeper knowledge because so many books have been written do during the last 20 years about the civil war. One example, I can give you one example. What led me to write the book Mirage 38, Kangastus Kolkit Kaheksan, which has this woman as the main protagonist who has been in the prison camps as a 16, 17 year old girl. She was totally crucial to that novel. I wouldn't have written it without reading some research, some newly published books that for the first time brought to attention that after, in the aftermath of the civil war in the spring and summer of 1918, also really, really young girls were put in prison and in these prison camps for having done at times basically almost nothing, stealing some food to, to give to their kid siblings, kid brothers, when, when the parents had, had, uh, had died or disappeared in, in the war. It, it didn't take much to be imprisoned at that time, just to be on the wrong side of a particular no, no. dividing line. This was a really cruel time. I mean, I, I want to stress also that both parties were to blame. At the beginning of the civil war in, in January and February, uh, uh, in the winter of, of 1918, uh, the Reds, who had taken control over southern Finland, uh, committed some really, many really cruel murders. But then when everything changed and the Whites won the war, which was quite obvious that they would do because they were better equipped and they had better officers and, and so on, the revenge... The vengeance after the war was was really, really cruel. And of course, some of the Reds that were executed or, 
of putting these prison camps had committed hideous crimes, but there were many who had done so little and sometimes hardly anything. And when I started to understand this period more deeply, I, it really took a lot of... Um, it was difficult to write about it because it was difficult to acknowledge that my country, we who live here, and our ancestors had done this, had committed this to one another. So why it's a painful thing to talk about? People try to avoid This is... It, I mean, when I try to understand my own people and my own country, I, I don't wonder that it has been difficult for generations to talk about it because there, there's, there's hardly... I mean, a war is always... A war and it's always an atrocity it, it always destroys people but there's no worse war than a war where neighbor turns against neighbor and in some cases even even brothers against brothers because there were families with perhaps five kids and you would have you know three kids on the red side and two kids on the white side and brothers would be be shooting at each other so i just wanted to talk about um <clears throat> Mirage 38, Kangas uh, 38, um, for a second, because there was one aspect of that book which did hit the headlines in Finland um, and caused a uh, a change uh, many, many years after the fact. And just to explain that, there was um, the characters go to an athletics meet and the Jewish runner wins a race, mm. uh, but the organizers announce him as finishing in fourth place. Yes. Uh, and this actually happened. This is, this is based on, on, on historical facts. Yes. This has more to do with the uh, sentiments of the 1930s, of the late 1930s. The, the novel takes place in 1938, mm -hmm. and also this athletics competition takes place in June 1938. And uh, the basis for that book is the sufferings of this woman uh, in the prison camps 1918. But this is, uh, then again, the actual story is, is placed in 1938, and it's uh, it's based on facts. It was the there were the inaugural competitions, athletics competitions at the newly built uh, Olympic Stadium. Because if the Second World War hadn't broken out, Finland would have hosted the 1940 uh, Summer Olympics, not the 1952, as happened. And we had these inaugural competitions, and uh, all the best Finnish sprinters were competing in the race, and this Jewish runner, who in reality was called Abraham Tokasir, uh, I renamed him in the book, uh, he won the race, and you can see that clearly, you see it on the on the photos from that race, and there were probably 10 or 20,000 people watching, maybe even more, I don't know, and they placed him fourth. Allegedly, because there were high-ranked Nazi, German Nazi officials uh, in the audience as guests of honor, but it has never been proved. This is just speculation. But anyway, they did that. And when I fi found this uh, this case, when I was writing my book placed in 1938, of course I had to use it, use it, because it's such a it's such a horrid example of how frail even our democracy is, our normal institutions. I mean, if you, it's an example of how insecure we are. In the end, if maybe tens of thousands of people can see someone win a uh, 100-meter race and he he's brutally placed fourth and nobody says anything, nobody does anything. I mean, I know that at that point in time in 1938, in June 1938, there were people who who tried to contact contact high-ranking high people in Helsinki to correct the wrongdoing, but it didn't happen. And then when I used it and fictionalized it in my novel, to my own surprise and joy, things happened. Journalists noticed they had tried to revive the case during the decades. So they noticed that this is based on, on reality. They started writing about it and the Finnish Athletics Association. They asked the, the runner, the actual winner, who, who died already in 1976, they, they, asked, they apologized. And then some weeks later, they even changed, say, 75 years later, they changed the results. So, so he kind of got the victory posthumously. Well, he's dead since long, but he has a living daughter in Stockholm and also a nephew here in Helsinki. So the, I think the family was quite happy. You, you write about a lot of injustice, bigger injustices, I guess, um, than this. Yes, this is, 
when people have complimented me for showing that literature can make difference in this, I, I have always replied that I would hope literature could make difference, make a difference also when it comes to bigger issues. Any in particular you want to mention? Well, peace on earth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> let's hold our hope for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, let, let's talk about war again. <laughs> The, the, it's often mentioned that, that Finland came together um, to to fight off the Soviet invasion, and that healed a lot of the wounds in the civil war. Um, the winter war, in, yeah, yes, in the winter war. When the winter war began, and and the events of the winter war, we were in a way to call it a healing is probably to exaggerate, but we were unified. There was a unification. Do you think this unification would have been possible? In any other circumstance, it would have taken much long, a much longer time. It it wouldn't have happened in in nineteen thirty nine. Um, but I think sooner or later it would have happened, because, in my opinion, in my interpretation of us Finns, is that we we're um, there's a certain even if we are silent and <laughs> and restrained, there's a certain hot bloodedness behind this. Uh, peaceful or restrained surface, but we also have a lot of pragmatism. We wouldn't have survived the 20th century without this pragmatism. We have showed, I mean, one example of this pragmatism is, for example, when Spain had a civil war between the year 1936 and the year 1939, afterwards they lived uh, for 40 years under the dictatorship of Franco and basically the fascists. In Finland, when we had the civil war, in 1918, as soon as 1926, we had a social democratic minority government for, I think, a little less than a year. So the, this pragmatism, I think, would have saved us anyway, but it would have taken a uh, much longer time. So it's a real quality to, to, to be able to leave things unsaid, to let sleeping dogs lie. No, I don't think, I think in, in an ideal world, you would deal with... The way of dealing with things that the Germans called Vergangenheitsbewältigung, which they had to do after after the Nazi era, that you 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 look at things and and you see the wrongdoings and you and you kind of accept them and and try to apologize for them, even if they would be wrongdoings that actually can't be apologized. But human nature <laughs> is different. We have this when we try to survive, we try to evade things. We try to not deal with things. I mean, many of the things also in the 1920s in Finland are awful to think about. All these red orphans that were put into orphanages and, and treated many times really badly and so on. But on the other hand, we were a country that was basically very poor and had been trashed by a civil war. Then they had to start building things. And in a way, the situation was not the same, but alike in 1940 five when the second world war ended a lot of people tens of thousands of men had died uh, the country was impoverished uh, by the war and you had to start building building it up again and i have i regret that this is the fact but i have some understanding for the fact that sometimes people just can't talk things through they just have to start working to survive this is what happened during the 20th century a couple of times in Finland. But it would definitely have been better if we could have dealt with things uh, sooner and faster. The German example is, is pretty good, I think, in this. this um, it, it is, but then again, you have to keep in mind that what had happened in Germany was one of the biggest atrocities in history, the worst atrocities in history. So uh, there are uh, differences in, in the dimensions Yes, in I, my I, opinion, <laughs> I would. Yeah, between Finland, I'm, but I'm think I grew up in England, and I, mm. I remember the way we taught colonialism in school was. There are probably parallels with the way the civil war is taught in Finnish schools. I think um, there could be yes, and yes. a little bit more of the German approach might help in Britain. The whole <laughs> complex of of teaching the truth to kids in school is quite deep. I mean, it should be done, but it's very seldom done. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is true. We've touched on the, the Second World War and this, this lightning sprint through the 20th century. I want to talk a little bit about the post-war period and um, in particular 
uh, my own personal obsession, which is football. Um, because well, it's one of mine. Too, <laughs> well, so. This is perfect. Then. It is. Um, it always struck me when I moved to Finland, uh, what fifteen years ago, no, thirteen years ago, that it was strange that there were left wing clubs and right wing clubs historically. Mm. I mean, this has faded a lot. It's not so. It's prominent faded, yes. In, yes. In, in in modern football, um, but still, especially in in. Some clubs in Tampere and in the other places, um, there are clubs that have historically been from a working class background, to a workers club. I mean, how has it played out in Finnish history? Why did this happen? If you go as far back as the 1920s, immediately after the civil war, I mean, we had we we not only had working class football clubs and athletics clubs and so on, and and uh, let's call them white or bourgeoisie. Uh, football clubs and athletic clubs. They even competed in their own different series. They couldn't compete in the same series. Things were still too tense and, and people were too ravaged by the war. Uh, this continued for quite a while. I know my, my father, who's now in his 80s, and he was uh, he, he grew up in Pietarsaari, uh, Jakobstad in Swedish, and which is a football city, later renowned for the Eremenkos, the yes. Eremenko family. <laughs> no, no. And in the late 50s, when my father was playing there, there was a club called Drott, which is the predecessor to Jaro, the big club nowadays, which was bourgeoisie. And then there was JBK, Jakobstad's ball club, social democratic, and then there was inter-communist. Okay. <laughs> so the divisions sometimes were really, really clear. And even in my childhood, I remember when we went up to Pietarsari to visit my paternal grandmother, uh, my father had, a, I think it was a cousin who played in Inter, and then we went and, and see the game, and it was clearly this was the communist club, <laughs> which played in the lower divisions. <laughs> okay. The bourgeoisie club was always the one that was uh, most successful. And this is a really small town. It's like what fifteen thousand, well, twenty thousand, maybe twenty thousand yes. people. Yeah. But even in that, in a town that small, mm -hmm. you had this division. And in Tampere, which is the famous industrial city of Finland, Finland's Manchester, it was called for a long time. It doesn't apply today because factories are now cultural centers or, or, <laughs> yeah. or residential areas. but Newspaper offices. <laughs> and newspaper offices. But it used to be and in Tampere, uh, where I had my maternal grandmother, and I visited Tampere a lot when I was a kid, and, and you could sense this political division. In, I was so interested in sports, so I knew all this. Not everybody knew it, but if you were interested enough, you sensed it and you learned it very quickly. But nowadays it's different. I mean, if you take a peek at, Hockey, ice hockey, the biggest sport in Finland. I mean, the clubs are all run like capitalistic uh, organizations <laughs> <Yeah>. nowadays. <laughs> yeah, and and actually, I mean, if if you take a look at football, it's decidedly also in England. I mean, it's a it's a working class sport. That's the origins of of football. And well, nowadays with the ownerships and you know the wages the players have, it's uh, it's changed. Well, this is this is exactly why this stuck in my mind because very early on in my period in Finland in Tampere, um, I did meet some TPV fans who they were quite old, mm. um, and it was good for me to practice my Finnish because they didn't speak English. Yes, of course. And they wanted me to tell them who was the working class and who was the bourgeois club in Manchester and in Sheffield, which is where mm. I'm from. And I had to try to explain <laughs> that no, it's different in England. Every, everyone is working class in a football stadium, basically. Um, it used to be like that, yes. Yeah, I mean, th those in are the Finland also, the we we grew up watching this one. It wasn't Premier League at the time. It was I don't know. Remember what it, what the English first league was called? But we we grew up watching uh, one game Saturday night on on YLE. Yeah, and and it was like it was always raining. It was muddy, <laughs> and there were players. I remember a player of Wolverhampton called Kenny Hibbit. He was all yeah. muddy, and you know it was very physical, and it was so different from from when you watch a Premier League game today. Oh yeah, it, it, English football has changed a lot, not always for the better. But we're straying from the topic somewhat. <laughs> okay. I have one last question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got folks. excited it's by the ish, by the topic. <laughs> It's usually me that digresses towards football, so I'll take the blame. But um, we often talk about polarization in politics, in modern day Finnish politics mm -hmm. and society. Um, extremism, it seems to be on the rise. 
Are you concerned about the divisions in Finnish society, the emerging divisions? At the moment, yeah, the emerging ones, yes, I am. And I'm also concerned and quite puzzled by the fact that, I mean, I grew up, I was a child in the 60s, I was a teenager in the 70s, a young adult in the 80s. In those times, uh, the 20th century divisions in European societies uh, still applied. Uh, it was uh, a struggle between the left and the right in in a very classical sense, socialism on one side, capitalism and profit on the other side. Today there are emerging divisions and they are different. I mean, I just I just some days ago, maybe even yesterday, I read an article in a Swedish renowned magazine which published uh, research results showing that the voters who vote for the left at least in Sweden, are more and more urban, quite well-to-do people, and that the working class is moving to the right, actually voting for these populist parties that are at the moment so successful in so many European countries, the Sweden Democrats or the, what do you call them in English, Perussuomalaiset? Uh, the Finns party. The Finns party have uh, almost 25% at the moment in certain polls. I mean, this is a big big difference and I'm puzzled by it and I'm worried by it because in my opinion what has enabled us Finns to survive during this troubled 20th century we had it was really troubled there were internal conflicts and we also got into wars with the Soviet Union and so on what enabled us to survive as a country and as a society was that despite all the divisions and the differences in opinions we still somehow managed to make the country more affluent and to keep the country together and this kind of unity i think um, was a trait of all the the scandinavian and the nordic countries also sweden norway denmark now things are changing very fast and i'm i'm not sure where, where it will all end and i'm also deeply worried <laughs> okay a uh, concerning note to end on but it was something to think about as we uh, head towards finnish independence day And that's about all we have time for this week. I'm off to visit family in the countryside and, of course, watch the Independence Day reception. Chell, do you have any plans for the weekend? Yes, to rest. <laughs> I've had a busy autumn, so we have, uh, my wife and I are planning to spend... I have a, I'm have giving an Independence Day speech in Siuntio, just uh, 40 kilometers outside Helsinki. And, but after that, that's uh, at noon. Okay, after can the audience come and listen to the speech? I think it's open. Okay. Yes, yes, it's a it's an Independence Day celebration, which is which is open to the public. And then my wife and I plan to cook a good dinner and and just watch. Maybe we watched half of the Irishman mm -hmm. a couple of nights ago. Maybe we'll watch the second half of it. <laughs> okay, that sounds very restful. <laughs> it's not so much. No, <laughs> you paint houses, don't you? <laughs> No. So thank you to my guest, Chelvesto, and to you, you, our audience, for listening in and joining the discussion. Don't forget to stay in touch via the Uther News Facebook, Twitter and Instagram accounts and get the latest news updates from our website at wiley.fi slash news. This week's show was produced by Priya Ramachandran D'Souza and our audio engineer was Laura Coso. Thanks for joining us and don't forget to tune in again next week. You've been listening to All Points North, a podcast produced by Ula News, a unit of the Finnish Broadcasting Company. For daily news from Finland in English, head to yle.fi slash news and follow us online at Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. You've been listening to Ule News. Remember, you can join the conversation too. Let us know what you think via Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. You can also leave a voice message on WhatsApp, where our number is plus 358 44 421 0909.